for painting Renly Baratheon, Lord Paramount of the Stormlands. And the focus, the main focus here is going to be trying to get that green metallic armor that he's depicted with. Uh, but we will finish the rest of the model too. So I started off with uh, the polyurethane black primer from Vallejo, just used through an airbrush. And to get the build, we're going to build up the metallic look for this model with using metallic paints. And some of my favorite ones to get like a nice metallic shine off of, especially through the airbrush, are these Vallejo acrylic metal color uh, paints. We're starting off with steel as the base. And if you think about angles that you shoot the paint at your model from, we're kind of looking at this like... I don't know, it's not 45, it's probably like a 25 degree angle or something where it's pretty sharp, like almost directly on the model. We're leaving some of the black underneath, but for the most part we're trying to make this model super metal colored. And then I come in with the chrome from that same line, and this one is kind of going from like both the 90 and 45. So we're just kind of covering the model to get this huge, to get it all set with this really bright metallic color. Next we're getting a little techy here. We're mixing in two different uh, uh, contrast paints from GW, and then we have an FW ink from Dollar and Roni, and I think that one is Indian Yellow. And the mix between that etheric green and warplock green uh, is, uh, I think it's probably like one to one to three, like so green, green, yellow. And when you're painting this over, you're really just trying to like mask the the metal color with a green you're not trying to cover it completely so i'm being pretty delicate when it comes to spraying this color out uh and in my opinion when this gets covered i probably went a little too heavy on it because it looks more green than what i would like it to i kind of want this really like faded yellowy green that you see kind of on the artwork i think my my charismatic air is more that color but this one just came out a little too green so you can kind of see what not to do if you're not using an airbrush for this you can still use these colors or try and use just whatever green you think fits best for you and instead of putting them on just straight thin them down with something whether you're using like water to cut your paints I would probably go with Flow Improver from Liquitex. And then you can paint that on there, and you're not going to want to slather it on like a wash. You're just going to want to use it more like a really thin glaze. And you should be able to get a similar effect with this. So right now we do have some uh, some highlights already because this uh, wash kind of pulls towards the... Well, not wash. It's more of like an ink, right? It kind of pulls towards the recesses a little bit, but we're not going that heavy, so we aren't getting those super dark contrasting shadows in the recesses. So I'm coming in and doing my traditional highlights with a paintbrush, and uh, the first color we start out with is Scale 7 Fives Pyrido Alchemy. And these colors come in, uh, they, they come separate on their own, but uh, I've been a really big uh, supporter of the Scale 75 metals. Uh, they just paint so nice. I like my Vallejo acrylic metal colors for airbrushing, but when you use them as a regular paint, they, they don't really allow for a whole lot of blending or um, uh, like glazing or layering. They just kind of go on in one big shot and then you're hoping to just knock them down one shade at a time to try and build those up because they just don't work the same way as traditional paints do but the uh, scale 7 5 metal acrylic range that they have is really good for this it, it, you can thin it down quite a bit to kind of get this glaze consistency and uh, you can also blend them together really well so i suggest if you if you're having some problems finding a good metallic paint that doesn't look like you're painting a the uh, booth seat of a classic Denny's or something with all those big huge metal pigments in there I would definitely consider picking some up and I think now up until April 15th I want to say I'm not 100% sure but sometime in April the sale will stop but uh, scale 75 has like 15% off on their orders <clears throat> so I'm not like trying to force you to or push you in the direction to go get their stuff but for me it's one of the best metals that I've worked with, and uh, it's a pretty good time to grab them if you want. So back to the, the painting here. We're just kind of picking out the details. I want to leave a lot of the green behind on this model, and that's 
I'm kind of not leaving a ton of it behind because I do think that I went a little overboard with the green. Uh, the more you layer this stuff up, the more saturated that color gets, and it wasn't really kind wasn't really what I was going for. Um, I was kind of going for more of the the faded green that like uh what is it like a d I guess just a desaturated green that you'll see on the artwork. But I think uh, the charismatic air is pretty fun to paint this on in general, just because there's a lot of breaks in the armor, and there's a few there. You get a good mix of plating, right? There's some nice big uh, open areas where you can really lay down this highlight color to show some uh, light bouncing off, and then there's some nice sharp edges where you can get uh, some of that happening too. So I think that's the run of the first highlight for Renly, I think, oh, we missed, uh, I kind of interpreted some of these back plates as sections of armor, but I really, they really could have been cloth, but to me it looked like the model's mostly covered in armor. So to bring the highlight up even just a little more, and this is a step you don't have to do if you don't want to, but I think there's no such thing as too many highlights. So I'm taking the citrine alchemy from scale 7.5 and mixing that in with the Pyrido alchemy, and uh, I think when I when I ended up mixing these two, I might have went a little too much on the Pirido Alchemy side because my uh, highlights aren't quite exaggerated enough for me. I mean, they're still highlighted, and you can tell there's like a, a definite high point color, but I probably could have done this one more time. But I'm being quite reserved with this color in general, so we're just kind of hitting the shoulder pads because they're nice big flat surfaces and will reflect a lot of light and I'm kind of pointing the light source from uh, I don't know based on where the models being held up right now I would say it's kind of in that like five or uh, no it's more like a seven o'clock position I guess eight o'clock position not that that's it, the lights kind of coming from him uh, towards his like sword arm and his face and uh, I'm not trying to do the light from straight up on top of him, but I am highlighting the opposite side of him just to kind of make sure that this armor shows is like catching a lot of light. It's going to be shiny. It's going to be polished. And any little bit of light that uh, pops up on it, he should be able to, uh, or the armor will b bounce off because it's not like rugged or beat up or anything. You know, Renly's got some pretty, uh, some pretty well-kept armor. So you saw me use my finger there on the model. Um, oftentimes I end up using my fingers to blend. Since I'm wearing these gloves, it's not working out quite as much as I wanted it to. I think I ended up over-highlighting an area and kind of bypassing my previous highlights, so I just rubbed a little bit of that off to kind of spread it out a little. So now we're going to work on the sword. When it comes to the rest of the metal that's on Renly, I don't feel like there's a ton that I want to vary with silvers. So I just want to do the blade of his sword with this, and for that we're using the Scale 7.5 Heavy Metal as the base, and then we're going to put a highlight on there with uh, Scale 7.5's hev or Heavy Metal. Yeah, so or, I'm sorry. Black Metal is the base, Heavy Metal is the highlight. And you could take this up a little bit more if you wanted to, but I just didn't want to get it too shiny. I think... Uh, I probably could have gone one more highlight level for them, which I think is maybe, for me, it's mixing speed metal with heavy metal because the speed metal is super duper bright and uh, just a little bit over what the what you would expect the natural transition from the heavy metal to speed metal would be. But I don't mind under highlighting the sword here. This way it doesn't stand out too much from Renly since he's going to, you know, we want... With this green armor in my army, at least, he's going to stick out like a sore thumb, but I didn't want to uh, draw too much attention to that sword, so I think under-highlighting it is fine here. So for the golds, we're going to go with Viking gold as the base. We're highlighting with dwarven gold, and then we're doing an ultra-highlight with uh, elven gold from that same scale 7-5 line. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of going outside of the parameters of what the box art looks like. Usually I try to keep things pretty close to that. I don't like to deviate too much from how the stuff is presented to me, but I just wanted Renly to have a little bit more glitz and glamour on his armor. So we're doing the little, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't know what the, I'm not, I don't understand the anatomy of armor, but he's got these little circles that almost connect his shoulder pads to his breastplate. 
And uh, we're doing the two little circles in green. Of course, we're doing the pommel and the hilt in, uh, in gold as well. We're going to be hitting the stag on his chest in that color or in gold as well, along with the visor on his helmet. I think that it helps break the model up a little bit. And I know we're getting into that green and gold territory. And it's like for a Wisconsinite, it's like you're painting Green Bay Packers. You just can't get away from it. So it, it's I'm trying to be a little bit reserved with it, but uh, we're also going to be adding more yellow to this, so we're really not leaving that, you know, Brett Favre vibe behind. When we get to the stag that's embossed on his chest, these these pieces can be easy to paint depending on how sharp the detail is. And it's not that the detail on this isn't super sharp. It's just that where it's positioned and how small it is, it's kind of hard to get to. So for me, the best thing to do is just kind of angle your brush underneath and kind of hit it from the side so you're not putting the whole tip of the brush down on the model because that's where you're going to get some uh, um, overspill into areas where you don't want it to be that color. And since we did this very specific process to get the green armor, it's going to be hard to go back and fix any of the oopsies that we did if that metal dries too fast. You can use the trick that I've shown before where you kind of wet your brush and then uh, try and dilute the paint that went into the area you don't want it to be so then you can wick it off but if you just use the edges kind of like how you would do your traditional like games workshop edge highlighting that's usually enough to get the attention that you want brought to that piece on the model without uh without m messing it up or going too much doing too much or too little and now we've got the last bit of highlight i think is what we're on right now with that elven gold and uh, we're just hitting the tips of things and making sure we get the pointy part of his visor highlighted up. So uh, I think that does it for the gold portion. So now we're going to move on to the yellows. Now I have a whole video on painting yellow, so I'm kind of going to slop through this one. It's not going to be as techy because I think in the last uh, painting yellow video that I did, I did quite a bit of wet blending in that one. And here we're just going to do some cheaty layering. And the best place for me to start painting yellow, if I want to get a nice bright yellow, is to start out with uh, this Vallejo Game Color uh, Leather Brown. It's one of my favorites to use. I think I always have a nice stockpile of this one in the house because uh, when I buy Vallejo paints that are the game color or model color variety... I'll buy them in like sets of three or five because there's something about the process that Vallejo uses that causes their paints to kind of shift a little bit in hue from paint to paint. And it's not a huge deal. It's just that I really like this color of uh, leather brown and I really don't want it to get pointed any more towards yellow than what it could in uh, in the little shifts that can happen. But the uh, the... The thing to pay attention to outside of just that, that's just my little side rant about Vallejo colors, but with this particular color, Vallejo Game Colors line, I guess, it covers pretty well, but it's not something like the GW base. They're highly pigmented, but for whatever reason, they have a hard time, just like all paints have a hard time, kind of blocking out not only darker colors, but they also have an issue blocking out these really strong metallics that we've put down. Now we've cut down the sharpness of the shine on this metal quite a bit by throwing that opaque layer of green over it, but I will have to hit this model twice with that. And here's what it looks like once we've really blocked that color in. We've got a nice foundation for building up our yellow, and my next go-to color for trying to build up to the, the super bright yellow that you're used to seeing or that most people want to see in their miniatures is going with Averlin Sunset from Games Workshop. This is from their baseline, which I'm also a really huge supporter of because they are so highly pigmented and you can do so much with them. Uh, you can block out darker colors pretty easily with these, and uh, you can thin them down quite a bit, and they'll keep their... Uh, consistency because that pigmentation is so high so you can get a nice glaze made out of them but as i said earlier we're kind of doing like a lazy person's uh layering where the difference between averland sunset and leather brown from vallejo is so uh subtle that when I put this on, it looks like it's a bit stark, but once it dries, it loses a little bit of its luster and starts to blend in with the uh, with the previous brown that I had put on before. And I think with this one, I felt like it was too dark for the back of 
the back and underside of his cloak. So I've decided to wet blend that down a little bit. I just got a little cute here and said, I'm going to blend this up a little just to not have this big, uh, massive Averland sunset yellow piece hanging out in a place where I don't want it to be. So we're just kind of going over and picking up the folds of the cloth. I think that this model in particular has done really well for cloth painting. Uh, sometimes sculptors get a little too carried away with the folds in cloth. I think there's a, a Kickstarter that I was a part of that was recently fulfilled called Limbo, the Eternal War. And they have some cloth in there where there are so many wrinkles in it. Like, I, I you can tell that these undead things don't tailor their clothes because they're just like so ill-fitting and wavy that you have a hard time kind of getting these smooth highlights. And uh, with this model, at least, there's some nice folds in the cloth to show some dynamic movement, but they're not so heavily populated and concentrated in these tiny little folds that they become impossible to paint. Uh, I would, I've always said that the uh, models for A Song of Ice and Fire are pretty legit in terms of paintability. It doesn't seem like they come up with too many details that are just like out in the middle of nowhere and don't make a whole lot of sense and the robes on these newer models that they've got or the cloth that's on them really shows that the uh, sculptors know what they're doing in terms of paintability and I think it's I think it's Big Child Creatives that does these and they typically do a pretty good job on the sculpts so the next thing we're going to move on to is uh, hitting a couple of these outer folds with another layer of Averland Sunset. The uh, color does dull down a little bit when it dries. You can see it's kind of just naturally blended a little with the uh, with the, the, the brown that's stuck under or that I've put under it. But uh, just adding a little bit more or just one more layer of it is going to strengthen that tone and give us a nice brighter yellow that we can use to get into the next yellow that we're going to be working with. And that next yellow is going to be Uriel Yellow from uh, Citadel as well, or Games Workshop. This is one of their layer paints that I don't, I don't particularly enjoy a lot of the paints in this line. Some of them are pretty hit or miss. But in terms of yellow, this one seems to have a pretty decent, uh, a decent ability to hang around on the model. The pigmentation isn't too thin on it. I think recently I've gotten big into the Chimera yellows because that stuff is super heavily pigmented and lets me thin it down quite a bit to get it to where I want it because I think naturally when I paint I enjoy layering more than wet blending. It's just a little bit more simple and clean and there's a little bit more control that you have with it. <clears throat> but the instead of going with straight Uriel yellow right now, we're going to ease into that transition by mixing in uh, one part Averland Sunset and one part Uriel Yellow, just so that we don't have an extremely stark transition to the super bright yellow. And we're not going to be hitting this a second time to try and make sure that's established. We want these colors to transition a little bit uh, more naturally without trying to really define those tones. But now I'm going to go around and hit the model with just straight Uriel Yellow. And that's going to bring a lot of life to it and make that yellow pop and look really bright and cool. So we're just going to hit the very outside edges. And I think I intended to pay more attention to the areas where I said my light source was going to be coming from. But like most miniature painters, I'm still kind of just putting the highlights where I feel like they're where I feel like I want them to be instead of where they should actually go, uh, which is fine. You don't need to paint with the greatest reference of light and you just do what you want to and uh and everything will look pretty sweet regardless of of how it is no one's going to sit there and criticize your light direction when it comes to painting models but that's the yellow finish and i think it looks pretty decent for how haphazardly we had put it on the model without trying to make sure that those transitions are really uh perfect so Renly does have a belt and a scabbard hanging around him, and I'm going to hit this line of paint that I uh, didn't recently pick up. I think I picked this up uh, at Adepticon 2019 or 2018, something like that. And uh, this is, pro it's called Pro Acryl, but I wanted to say that it was MIG paint as well. 
or maybe I'm mixing up brands. I know that it's Pro Acryl and that Creature Caster is the vendor that sells this one. And I've taken a liking to this paint lately. There are some things that I have some problems doing with it, but when it comes to just kind of packing down a color or getting some some colors that just other lines don't seem to have a good uh, a good paint for, uh, they they seem to really make up for some of the problems that I have in that category. Um, this paint in particular, the mahogany that they have, is a really great brownish red, and uh, it serves as a good base to paint any kind of red. But the but I am kind of keeping it brown for this one because and uh, the reason why I wanted it pointed more towards red is that we have a lot of green on this model so and there's not a lot of opportunity for me to introduce a whole lot of contrast on this one so I'm using a, the brown to incorporate some of those red elements in order to make this stand out against the model a little better since we're just yellow and green. And then I am doing something just a little like this is probably an unnecessary step, but I am going to shift away from the artwork again by not painting the horns in a metallic color. I'm going to be painting them as natural bone instead. So I like I for whatever reason, I like the look of uh, horn tips to be a little darkened. So we're going to just start that by putting it on the on the top or the tips of the, the horns. For the highlight on the on the leather, I'm not going too crazy with this one. I don't want it to stand out a ton because I don't want to lose the red that's in there. So we're mixing a little bit of the mahogany. I think it's, again, probably a one-to-one -one ratio of mahogany and light umber. Light umber is a super brown color. It's really light, but it doesn't seem to have a whole lot of yellow or uh, red elements in it. It seems like it's a desaturated brown. And that's not really the highlight that I wanted to go with this, but I also didn't want to do a bright red highlight or kind of like really sell the red. I wanted to keep it kind of brown. So if I mix those two colors, I get a nice highlight without losing a lot of the contrast. Next up, we're going to move on to the horns again. And one of the best ways to start my horns or bone in general is with that same color I was talking about before, the uh, Vallejo leather brown. Uh, I think... No, I think I do paint leather with that color, but for the most part, it's like starting out anything in yellow and starting out anything in bone. I think this color is extremely versatile, and it goes on really well and can do a lot for you. So if you're looking for a color that's kind of in that yellow-brown category, this is the one I grab every time. And as I had said earlier, I've always got tons of bottles of this stuff hanging around. So we're just going to cover the... The horns that are connected to his head, we're leaving behind the a little bit of the uh, dark brown on the tips of the horns. And again, that, that step wasn't super duper necessary because I think I end up covering them up anyways. I was just preparing for if I wanted to leave a little bit of it there, I had it there. And I think the focus went on my hand because I was just not in frame properly, so I apologize for that. But we're just covering, we're just base coating horns. There's nothing special here. So I let this dry up for a while, and then we're going to come in with uh, the straight uh, Morgast Brown is what I think it was from Games Workshop as well. Again, another uh, base paint from Games Workshop. And I actually, I think when I did the leather brown for this, I had mixed those two together so I didn't have to worry about building it up so much. And uh, that's probably why we ha only had to have the one, ba the one coat on there in order to get that color to show up well. But the Morgas Brown is now just going around and highlighting the edges of the bone on his horns. And then uh, I think I end up mixing a little bit of the Morgas Brown with that Mahogany Brown from Pro Acryl. And that's going to get the tips of the horns done. Oh, maybe I, I, maybe I jumped the gun a little bit. I must have done Marion, or I, I call it Marion Brown because that's what, the, what my bottles are labeled as. There are, most of my bottles are labeled in Spanish. But um, the leather brown was probably put on first, then leather brown mixed with the more, more gassed brown, and now we're just doing the more gassed brown highlights. So probably a few more steps than what you really need to do. Uh, you could just go the leather brown mixed with uh, more gassed brown and then uh, highlight to the, the, the white there, or the more gassed brown. So I think now we're, we're just getting the... 
now we're getting the highlights done on these horns. And that'll stand out pretty well from Renly because it's kind of pointed a little bit more towards that yellow side. So we've got some decent uh, breakup on the model here. He looks a little bit more uh, varied than just being completely full of green. So now we've got, we finally got the Morgas Brown mixed with mahogany and we're just hitting the tips of Renly's horns. On a larger model or one that I was trying to do for more of a competition type thing, I would probably go in and paint each one of these lines on the tips as best as I could and then even put a darker line in between those. But Renly's just getting tabletop ready. I'm not doing, uh, doing anything too... Uh, I'm not trying to be extremely... Uh, attentive to the details here and I think I do take just straight mahogany brown and just lightly touch the tips with my air with my brush to get that darker part to communicate so I realize now that the lighting's not super great for this model but we finished the basing and then this is where Renly's at totally so hopefully this gives you a good idea of how to paint your Renly Baratheon if you're traveling if you're having a hard time getting that green armor uh, this should give you a good starting point to kind of adapt your own process thanks for watching and I look forward to making the next one for you